It's a recommendation. Yeah, I mean, the Yeah, I think it's a big deal. The agenda. Welcome. Minutes. Approval of minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. I kind of want to do But I'm, I'm asking to keep short. Morning, everybody. We're still letting people in, so we'll get started here in a few minutes. Judge, it is 10 01. We've got tons of people online and rare. We have a forum. We're ready to go. All right. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our JCIT meeting. Glad to see everybody online. Uh, would you mind calling out the people who are online, Casey, for the benefit of the group here in sure. the office? Sure. We've got online. Um, Billy Hart, Chris Ricci, Clint Ludwig, David Escamilla, Dean Stanzioni, uh, Dean L. Williamson, Doug Gowan, Ed Wells, Evan Ramsta, um, Laura Hinojosa, Jess Griffith, Judge Ferguson, Judge Stith, uh, Mike Caro, and Matt Davis. And then let me scroll down. Then uh, we also have uh, Nancy Reister, Judge Swearingen, uh, Roland Johnson, Sion Shilhab, Todd Cope, Tracy Hopper, and everybody here in the room. All right. Did was anybody is anybody on the line that whose name was not called? And then we've got now Justice Doss and Justice Boyd also online. Excellent. Um, all right, so thank you for joining us, and we will go ahead and begin. Um, first thing we'll take up are the minutes from our last meeting. Um, I hope you had an opportunity to take a look at that. Um, does anybody have any comments, additions, or deletions? Please make sure that if you were here, either um, online or here at the meeting, that you um, are noted on the minutes, because we do keep track of attendance. So uh, do I have um, any motion? 
So I have a motion to um, accept the minutes. Do I have a second? A second. Okay, all in favor, aye. 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 All right, so the minutes are accepted. Let me see your agenda. Um, all right, so as usual, we're gonna start with our program updates as far as Research Texas uh, guide and file. Uh, and I think we have we have Tyler. We have uh, Evan Acosta with Tyler Tech who is on the line. So Evan, I, I've allowed sharing, so you should be able to share your screen and go. All right, fantastic. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay, everybody, see my screen? Okay. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, uh, again, as always, thanks for giving us an opportunity to uh, present our. Status update at these meetings. It's good to see everybody this morning uh, virtually. Uh, we do have one extra person from Tyler on this side. He did call his name out, uh, Matt Davis. He's one of our senior leaders on the eSolutions side, has a long and storied history at Tyler. He's going to be doing a lot more help going forward um, from an operational standpoint in the eSolutions uh, organization. I'm sure Terry will probably talk to you a little bit more about that, Casey, and what that looks like at um, eCourts or somewhere around that time. But just wanted to give a quick introduction on who he is. Um, so uh, we'll keep this update a little bit brief. I know there's a lot of ground to cover in this meeting. So we'll start with sort of the, the basics. In the past couple months, uh, we've seen a, a pretty steady growth of our user counts. We're up to over 616,000 user counts that have been created to date. As usual, we average a, a little over 40,000 filings a day and about $1.2 million in uh, in court costs, transaction fees, and whatnot, including fees that go get distributed to the EFSPs, get collected on the daily. And we have um, we actually have uh, a pretty impressive amount of JPs that have, have uh, steadily gone live, especially this year. We've had quite a few. Um, we have 184 precincts live across 48 different counties. And we actually have seven more active and pending engagements that are currently going on, which anticipate a couple more going live, I think, before the end of the year. Um, we're actually approaching a pretty cool milestone with the JP filing. We're actually approaching about 10% of the filing volume um, across the state coming in from our JP courts. So they're averaging about 116, 117,000 filings a day. So almost 10%. So we're, we're approaching a really, really cool milestone there with that. Um, next up for Research Texas, uh, again, uh, similar to our, our user volume in, in the EFM for e-filing, we're growing pretty steadily when it comes to our users uh, in research. Uh, so we're at a, just under 48,000 total users. Um, you can see the legend at the bottom, what that breakdown looks like. Um, in November, we saw about just under $25,000 in revenue generated from document purchases. Again, just as a reminder, all revenue goes back to the clerk's Tyler season, none of that. Um, total number of documents purchased comes in a little bit under 21,000. One thing that's worth noting, we still feel that the document purchase um, the number of documents purchased and the revenue generated for the clerks is still a little bit low, mostly having to do with those couple bullet points that we've we've gone over several times uh, in, in previous meetings uh, where that a lot of clerks uh, feel that they want to have the option to add criminal data that the that some of the problems that were not a problem per se, but one of the challenges we have is that there are, are different solutions that are presenting different uh, document types uh, as far as criminal or non-criminal where our our um, Odyssey portal, if you will, will have uh, criminal data and criminal documents displayed where research does not. And then from our legal professional community, they don't feel that the it's um, quite as quite valuable enough to uh, subscribe or purchase documents because we are still missing the uh, judgments and orders uh, in research. So, and from our self-help side of the house, we have, again, 45 interviews currently available. Uh, seven of those interviews are actually integrated with eFile Texas EFM. The remainder of those can obviously be printed and filed with the local court. Um, the the self-help, the average completion rates continue to steadily grow, um, which I think is a, um, is attributed to the the 
um, updates we've been making steadily to the tool, hardening that solution a little bit, making the interviews a little bit easier to, to navigate, making the solution run a little bit more efficiently. So we're starting to see a very steady increase in the, the interviews that are completed and actually either printed or electronically filed. And on that note, we see about 75% of the, the self-help filings are actually electronically filed versus um, printed and brought to the court. And that actually is something that is also uh, been steadily increasing. And I won't go too deep into the, the um, usage per major cities. I figure we can, you guys can read that um, once this deck is distributed after the meeting. And uh, lastly, the eFile Texas 2.0 update. We are um, knee deep in cycle two. We're actually in the middle of user acceptance testing. Um, some of the some of the cycle two feature highlights that we're going to be that we're going to be bringing with this next um, deployment is going to be things like our composable security model. If you're not familiar with that, is if you're an Odyssey customer um, and you create rights and roles within Odyssey, and you basically have that kind of that picker menu where you get to choose what rights and roles. Uh, uh, or what rights a particular role is available to do, and then save that and then assign that to a user. We're building something very comparable uh, in the EFM. Uh, Multi-factor authentication. So we're going to we're going to be integrating with Okta to be able to uh, utilize that multi-factor authentication system-wide broadcast notifications. This one I think is really cool. We're going to be able to push notifications out to the application, out to the users that are currently logged in at the time. So if there's some kind of announcement court closures, um, there's, an, there's an outage, God forbid, um, we can actually post something very quickly and inform users that, hey, we're experiencing some users stay, you know, go here for updates, things of that nature. So really cool stuff coming down the pipe. Uh, favorites and defaults. So um, very similar to our templates, except this will be housed in a microservice and can follow um, users from different EFSPs, different EFSPs if they use them for different reasons. Uh, a return for correction review action. So instead of go just back, having a standard. Stop. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, you're moving pretty fast. Let's go back Sorry to filer favorites and defaults. Can you explain mm -hmm. that a little bit more? So it's similar to our templates where you have a, a preset selection of criteria that you, let's say I majority of the time I'm always practicing in Denton County. So I want my default court whenever I go to file a new case to automatically have Denton County selected. So it'll be it'll be at the top of the menu versus you having to click a drop down and type or scroll through. It'll be right there at the very top. And the first thing that you can select, or in some cases, it will automatically be populated in the drop downs. So you'll be able to do things but, like, go ahead. I was just saying, is this through algorithm or choice? This will be by choice. So there will be a whole separate um, window that filers can go into when they log into the EFSP. And it may look different from EFSP to EFSP, but for ours, uh, the state the the state solution, they'll have a little menu where they can actually go select um, these defaults and favorites like uh, court location, case category, case type, payment type, things like that that will automatically be populated whenever they begin their filings. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next one, and I apologize, I'll, I'll slow down a little bit. Um, the return for correction review action. So um, it's a new type of it's a new type of review action. Uh, it's a more true uh, return for correction uh, versus the the reject action that filer that excuse me reviewers have been using um, for uh, basically since the inception. So this will give a, another alternative method a more true return for correction. We will be building upon that review action. So um, for this cycle, we'll, we'll introduce it. We'll have a whole new email template, a whole new workflow it follows. We'll be building upon that and we'll be able to introduce things like a grace period. So um, you'll be able to have a configurable grace period that says after three days, we no longer have a return for the return for correction review action. We'll no longer have the ability to um, copy the docket date if it's outside that that return that um, grace period for a filer to return it, um, and and things like uh, um, be able to better um, lock filers, so to speak, into a returned envelope versus them having to go create a whole new envelope, and you lose that continuity between an envelope that was copied or an envelope that wasn't copied. So it's just, it's making the return process a little bit more seamless for both clerks and filers. So we're really excited about that one too. And it's something that we're going to be building on in future cycles. And okay, uh, one stop. of the last, 
Go ahead. And talk about that a little more fully. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so in, in the past, if you return, if a clerk returns something for correction, yeah. they hit a button and then the filer has to go copy that envelope to a new envelope, is my understanding. To to correct it. And then it upload and correct it, the, that version in the new envelope and then submit it. And then the clerk has to say, oh, well, this is the replacement for that other envelope that I returned for correction. Let me okay. change the docket date so that it's docketed of the correct date on the previous envelope. And the reason it was done that way is the original e-filing system was never built or designed for this notion of clerks returning something and then the filers returning it back. And so this goes back to make it more of a seamless when you hit the return for correction button. The filer just uploads the corrected version and hits submit rather than go through this extra steps. So previously, or in the current system before this change, you could not use the same envelope in which the clerk sent it back to Correct. refile that would be rejected as already have been filed. So okay, so that so that didn't work. So in this way, we can have it seamless. It can be returned for correction without creating a new envelope, it gets returned within the existing envelope. Is that correct? I'm not 100% on what the what the actual workflow looks like. I think it may generate a new envelope number for tracking purposes, just so there is a unique ID for a unique submission, even if it is a return. Um, but what it what the idea behind this is to um, again, like Kay said, more seamless, make a almost not quite force a filer, but make it a little bit more difficult for them to to deviate from the the happy path, if you will. What we currently see is if a clerk returns a envelope for review, um, the most ideal um, path is for a filer to simply go in, copy the envelope, and resubmit with the corrections. Because what that does is whenever it goes back to the review queue for re-review. That new envelope is flagged and it says, hey, this is from a copied envelope. Would you like to see the original envelope details? They can click a button. So those two envelopes are linked. We don't see that happen as often as we'd like. So this will um, give us an opportunity to create a more enhanced workflow that makes it, again, a little bit more difficult for filers to deviate from that happy path. Okay, and then when we have the institution, we had talked or even voted actually on the amount of time in which um, a filer should have in order to make the, the corrections. And I guess that's not been implemented, but this is the process by which that will be implemented. Is that that's correct? correct? That's correct. That's correct. So the, the first step is to get that new workflow in place and then be able to iterate on that in future cycles. So this will be the first, the first step will be getting it in place getting the right email templates, basically kind of um, separating out an actual true rejection from a return for correction um, and be able to have different reasons uh, for each and be able to split those out uh, as they should be. And then um, the next step will be, I believe in cycle three or four, I have to double check my notes, we're going to be adding that grace period and it will be configurable. So whatever period of time um, is voted upon that says filers have five business days to return a filing, we'll be able to configure that. So anything outside that grace period, a filer wouldn't be able to have the opportunity to, they would still be able to copy the envelope, but they may not be able to get their original docket date. So that option will be missing for reviewers. So there aren't any accidental clicks and, um, you know, being able to revert that, that docket date to the original submission. Okay. I, I got a question. So what, what is the difference with this change than what it's currently done today? It, it won't be any different at first, except that you will have two different actions. One will be, one will be the reject action, um, which is what's existed um, it, since, since the, the dawn of the EFM. Um, and, and so, but what we'll be able, what we'll be able to do is make those reject um, choices like in that drop down, true rejections, fees missing, wrong court. So whatever it is that it's actually a true reje rejection, there is no grace period involved here. You you truly need to do a resubmission versus the return for correction says, hey, you got it, but there's some misspellings here. I need you to correct this and send the document so, back in. So there'll be two buttons now. There'll be a, re correct. a rejection and a return for correction button. 
That's correct. And then okay. once we get it implemented, we'll have to go through the, the process of, of getting clerks um, rights profiles and whatnot updated. So once it's out there, uh, we'll still have to still have to go through um, getting it actually set up for for courts that want to utilize both, which I believe a majority of them will. Yeah, I think the whole state would. Absolutely. Um, but when we still have the man, the clerk would still have the manual process of clicking the copy docket date even with this feature. That's correct. That's correct. Is that is that going to be eventually, as long as they did it in a certain timeline where we don't have to manually press a button? I think that's something that is definitely on the table and we could discuss whether that's a, a route that we we should go. If that's if you want for things that are automated, you want it to be one of those that's it's essentially that's the rule it's near 100 percent all the time that's what should be ha that's what should happen and we can obviously discuss that and see if there are any scenarios where that shouldn't happen and if so we may want to keep that um something that clerks manually do but maybe make it a little bit easier but tracy i, I, I agree to... i agree with you i agree yeah. with you tracy that i think that when we implement the grace period we probably would say copy the docket date and here's the grace period and if you're outside of that you don't get the docket right. Yeah, I'm trying right. to I'm trying to avoid manual user error. Right. Yeah, Agreed. that makes sense. And and that's something we can in case that's something you and I we can absolutely discuss with April um, offline to see absolutely. what that looks like because there's still plenty of time to to tweak the the grace day period because we're not even we're not even done with cycle three and I believe that's in cycle four. Okay. Yeah, it should go off of whatever the technology standards has. And maybe a rule of civil procedure. Yeah, right. I mean, we also will look at, we'll be looking at the rules of civil procedure just to see, um, you know, where in the rules that grace period needs to, to go. So. Yeah, it, and it's in the rules of civil procedure for sure. And I think uh, we may need to work with the Court of Criminal Appeals because I think they've right. got one in their electronic filing yeah. rules as well. Okay. Uh, this is Ralph Swearage, and I have a comment. If, if Evan, if, if it's possible, we would certainly like to uh, involve in participating in your review of the return for correction because it's been a big issue with us, and everything we do in this court for years has been all electronic filings in Tarrant County. Mm -hmm. And we'd mm -hmm. probably have some good ideas and some suggestions if, if you would like to you know, get with us, and we'll be glad to discuss it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that sounds um, great. Absolutely. We can we can absolutely arrange something. Um, so uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I don't want to cut anybody off. OK, no, uh, great, ahead. great discussion around that. I figured that one I wanted to include that. I figured it would be a, a, a nice talking point. And then lastly, one, I think that has been um, one of the most often asked for uh, changes, whether one the first one was being able to move lines of stamp as a block, which we have implemented now. The next one is to be able to alter the size of an image stamp. So drop the image stamp, be able to change its size and position. That is coming in this cycle as well with our new um, document and stamping microservice service that's being implemented. So that's another big one we've we've heard um, often. So really excited for that one as well. Um, one of the drawbacks to all the excitement is usually with excitement means it's a lot of change. And with a lot of change, there's a lot of challenges. So uh, some of the updates that are down here at the bottom corner, we are extending the UAT a little bit longer to be able to thoroughly test some of these new microservices because they are so um, complex. And the EFM is such a complex tool that we've uncovered some, um, some things that are not operating as efficiently as, as we'd like. Uh, so we're we are going back to um, tweak some of those things, particularly with the composable security model, and that's that's extending the UAT out a little bit longer, which means that uh, consequently on bullet point number two, the EFM cutover date, the go live for cycle two, will be extended out a commensurate amount of time. And then lastly, because um, our integrated partners are even still consuming some of the changes from cycle one. The way we'll be enabling these microservices is going to be in a phased approach. So to give an example, at the cycle two cutover date, we will be updating the EFM and there will be some microservices that will be flipped on. That's what we're calling table stakes, particularly the composable security model, because so many different pieces are writing on that, um, the new way of authenticating and, and calling our security um, protocols, um, but things like the the broadcast notifications and uh, the favorites and defaults, we may we may um, 
phase those in, you know, maybe after the go live another 15 to 30 days to give our integrated partners a little bit more time to consume and adapt to those changes. And also on our side, be able to support some of the, the new changes that are coming with cycle two. So are the feature, are the cycle two feature highlights? What is a microservice as opposed to a highlight? <laughs> So, um, well, it's this. So, the the feature highlights are essentially what we're going to be adding as far as mm -hmm. um, development and new features in the EFM. The microservice, you can think of it as a whole different application. Instead of everything okay. being nested within the EFM and having to take a full EFM update to, um, let's let me take a step back. Let's say there's a bug in our multi-factor authentication. Instead of having to do a full EFM update we've broke that out into a separate microservice, which is its own little miniature application. So instead of updating the entire monolithic EFM, all we have to do is just update that small little microservice um, in isolation, and it won't impact any of the other applications. We've started to move that direction. Um, that way we, we can be a little bit more flexible and faster with our deployments, with our feature enrichment versus having to update the entirety in the entire ecosystem to make one small change. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, that actually wraps it up for my cycle two updates and actually our, our um, e-file Texas program updates in general. Are there any questions? Yeah, can you go back to the JP map just so I can get sure. a better look at it, please? And I believe there's a larger version in the appendix that's a little bit easier to see some of these county names. No, no. Right. Okay, so can so are the larger counties are that is that where the JPs are that are mostly filing? It's hard for me to see the map. It's kind of because unfortunately AC's gonna fix the orientation of the zoom here. It's a little bit it's a little bit difficult for me to see Perfect. as well. But okay. yeah, I believe out of the top 10, we have a lot of the JPs. Like most notably, Harris, all of I believe 16 Harris County JPs are live. I believe Terrence got some JPs live. Dallas recently went live. Um, Denton is live. So we have a lot of the top 10 uh that are live. Collin County is live and actually been live for quite some time. Is Bear County anywhere close to going live with anyone? That's a great question. That's something I can actually check <laughs> offline. I I don't believe Bear County is live, but let me double check. Okay. All right. Good old Bear County. Yeah. <laughs> Tradition. Um. Okay. Uh. So. Since forty eight counties live, so I know. And so, are they? Are are the JP courts continuing to express interest. Are you getting inquiries? Yes. And, okay. All right. Yeah. Just... So we, this year, especially we've, I, I, we've actually had quite a bit of interest um, from the JP courts. I actually even going back further, I think it started around COVID times. We started getting a lot of a flurry of activity from JPs, uh, especially uh, wanting to, to um, go live previously. I think we had about three to 5% of the filing volume coming in from JPs. And now, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're creeping up to 10%. So we've almost doubled it in the last couple of years. So that's actually mm -hmm. a pretty impressive um, growth, uh, especially from such, uh, such a small representation of the courts. And also they aren't even mandatory yet. This is all voluntary filing. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions regarding any of the general presentation that we've just seen? Questions? No? Thank you very much. Very welcome. If you don't mind circulating this yeah, to... I'll, okay, I'll circulate thank this you. the okay. after our meeting today. All right, so we'll next move on to the updates on the uniform case management system. Yeah, and I'll give that real quick. So um, as you guys are aware, OCA contracted with um, Tyler Tech and I docket to do a uniform case management system for the counties 20,000 and under. Um, both companies are currently working with their early adopter. Tyler is actually going live with theirs starting on Monday um, in Crane County. And then I docket will go on later on early next calendar year. Um, one of the things that they're doing uh, as part of this contract is establishing the Texas standard as far as uh, these case management systems are, are concerned. 
And so like, for example, on the Tyler schedule, you can see even though Crane County is about to go live, they're not doing these counties serially. They're doing a ton of parallel. And so they've already got several other counties that are in the middle of data conversion. And then I think the schedule that I saw had them going on all the way through like August of this next calendar year, bringing more and more count, uh, counties online. Um, so we're excited that things are moving ahead on that. And I think at the end of the deal, we'll have something in the neighborhood of, what was it, 60? Six, uh, 60. Just over, I think it's 64, and they all have to be online by August because that's when the money has to be spent. spent. By. So, so <laughs> we'll get them all in, which is good. So um, the, our uh, project team on that is rocking and rolling on it with both. IDOC and Ann Tyler all moving ahead at the same time. So are those, okay. So so with that installation and that wrap up by August, mm -hmm. who else is left out there with no kind of Without case Without any kind of case management system, I don't believe anybody is. The issue becomes how robust that is and how good of a system. The One of the big reasons that we're doing this anyway or that we push this was that um, the data that we're getting and the data that they're then uploading to DPS and then on to NICS for um, gun safety isn't any good, or it's because their case management system doesn't track that or it's not tracking it that way. And so these two systems that we're rolling out, one of the requirements is you have to be able to batch upload to DPS every night. You have to be able to have your data reports so that you can do NICS reporting. You have to integrate with e-filing. You have to integrate with research. So just demanding that that these that our two products integrate okay. with everything. So I think we'll also find out, Justice Simmons, um, if there's any out there that don't have robust case management systems. Once we the, so y'all probably all know that the judicial council has called for the judiciaries to start collecting case level data, mm -hmm. and if they can't report that to OCA will know uh, and I know see. that their system is not, it's not able capable to do that. To okay. do that. Okay. Um, so hopefully um, if there are more out there that don't have robust systems that they can jump on the case management system. It's just a funding issue um, yep. that we have to watch. And have they, okay. And can anybody else jump on the money or is the money now all spent with the group that's going forward right now? I think we can still take a few more. Okay, yeah. Yes. Okay. And then, then, and then it also becomes a, um, if let's say we have an additional 30 counties that are interested, then we'll just have to go back to the legislature and ask for additional funding for that. Okay. All right. So we just need to keep track of it if we want to go back to the legislature this session. So, right. Okay. What, what is your um, response from the clerks and judges? In those counties that are the early adopters, right? have we surveyed um, them or? We haven't surveyed them yet. They're actively involved in the engagement, obviously, because they're configuring the system for their offices. Um, and they're the ones helping to set the Texas standard. So they're definitely engaged in it. And because it's voluntary, we're not saying you have to go use this system. So it's definitely from their own volition. But they will become your your marketing agents. Correct. They're going to tell other counties, hey, this exactly. solved a lot of problems or, or this crazy man, this really stinks or whatever. Whatever message you're going to give, they're going to give it. Yeah. And that's going to affect adoption. I think the only complaint that we've heard so far is the cost for data conversion. So it's costing um, the jurisdictions, I think, around $100,000 to do the data conversion. Um, and that is a process. But they're no longer having to pay for their case management systems right. each year. So uh, I, I think it's a well, we even have it's one. a better trade-off, but that initial cost um, has has caused some concerns. Right. And it, even to the point to where we've had one county that said, you know what, our docket is not as active. So we're just gonna let the active docket flow through the old system and we're gonna just start fresh with this one. That's a way. That's what I would do. And That's so we've so got one county doing that. How many counties do we have that have no existing case management? I think the clerk's offices, the last time we did a survey, it was about two or three. Good. And I think across those two or three, they would get a thousand new cases a year. So we can expect that cost to be borne by all of these small counties. If they choose to do a data conversion. To the data. Yeah. That's a lot. 
right so we and i mean the the other sticky wicket with it is that you can't make a prediction on how much it is going to cost and it's mainly because you don't know um their existing system and so you've got some vendors who'll say well yeah i'll give you the data it's going to be 30 grand to me as the vendor to get you my data that's in this system so well for a lot of those folks it might really be better just to start fresh day one right because you have no idea how much unstructured data exactly is out there in those in, in those older systems where somebody just case disposed of and well, they it's all ten it's all ten fifteen thousand dollars a year that's a lot of years to pay how for do they archive that grand stuff, grand though i mean okay so then it gets dusty in the closet and so somebody needs to you know go and and find these documents how the heck is that going to happen I don't know how they do that. <laughs> I mean, to Bob's point, if you write in the notes, case disposed, and it's just in a note, but you haven't changed it in the status field. Well, and I think, too, when for other um, <laughs> jurisdictions that have, outside of just even the, the uniform case management system that have converted, um, they have to clean up the data, and, yeah. and it, it does cause issues, too, with reporting. Um, we have some counties that have done recently transitioned to new case management systems and haven't reported um, in several months because of the data conversion issue. So it, it's, a, it's something that we have to watch for sure. Definitely. Okay. So that project's moving along. And this is on criminal and civil. Everything's getting jammed into the new case yep. management. Well, you know, they've got some, they've got to hang on to the criminal stuff. What the heck are they going to do with that? Even in the basement, <laughs> but it's not paper now. It's, I mean, yeah. yeah. Anyway, okay. It's not that. That's well, we had a fire. <laughs> yeah, right. We're stoking the. So okay. Well, that's something to think about. Um, as these small counties that are, and I certainly would understand the decision of just move forward with the new system and just somehow closet your old stuff, but that there are requirements for keeping that stuff. And certainly in the criminal sphere, that can be very important. So um, that may be something to think about in the future and just kind of see as we see these, the adoption and see that sure. go yeah. on. Okay, let's keep track of that. Okay, so, um, all right. So now we're gonna bring in what we're, um, looking at now is going to uh, address the Supreme Court has asked us to look once again at this immediate access to court records. That means um, we talk about that. It's it's um, access uh, before the clerk processes or reviews. So in other words, under Rule 21A and 21, um, records are deemed filed when they're uploaded and they go first to the you know EFSP then on to the EFM and at that point in time they can be visible but the clerk has not received them yet or processed them yet or anything else and so um, the question is what if anything previously two years ago we gave our recommendation that uh, we didn't believe that that was in the public interest, actually, uh, in the best interest of the state or the public to um, permit that type of access to anyone. But times change um, and some circumstances have changed. And so we're looking at that question again. We've had a subcommittee composed of attorneys, clerks, judges looking at this matter and have come up with a rough draft um of uh, that you know unfortunately was circulated probably late last night early this morning we've got some hard copies here if anybody needs it um regarding that recommendation so this is really our first full committee discussion about the um access and so um if it's all right with the committee i'm just going to summarize real quickly kind of what we did we met almost every single week except for thanksgiving to discuss this issue um and uh looked at what the prior recommendation had been and previously in 2020 the supreme court had asked us to look at a request 
um, by an entity known as Courthouse News. And Courthouse News is kind of a news consolidator. They go around and get information from courts. They have a bevy of clients that they provide information to um, for profit. This is their business model. Um, in the past, they were used to dealing with paper pleadings, and now they're dealing with digital pleadings. And they wanted a press queue or immediate access. At the time in 2020, we had not. We were operating. JCIT was operating under uh, an old contract with Tyler. It did not have this press queue feature as part of that contract. And to uh, get the ability to provide a press queue or immediate access at the EFM stage would have required significant financial investment um, to do. Uh, and Tyler at the time was also extraordinarily concerned with the liability it might have by allowing documents to go public before clerk review in the case of sensitive information so that they might be sued regarding that. They had wanted certain sorts of releases and waivers um, from the counties and from others before they would publish those uh, that information to the public. Um, so at the time, after looking at everything, we determined and decided not to recommend it. So in going back again, um, we've looked at it because right now we actually do have access under our new contract uh, with Tyler. We do have access to something known as an immediate access or public or press review access. Um, in fact, it is one of those things where some counties, um, and I think there are a couple have an immediate access. In other words, the county immediately um, approves the filing of, for instance, certain case types. It might be real estate cases. It might be some of the tax cases. Um, and so those uh, they're using the queue for that immediate acceptance of these cases, and they are very readily available then. Um, Travis County is using a press queue. Uh, for immediate access as well. I will note that JCIT developed a matrix before when we were dealing with remote access of documents in Research Texas that basically listed what documents would be available to the public user. For instance, we don't allow certain family law cases or juvenile cases or adoptions or things that are prohibited by statute. And we created a matrix um, that basically would guide um, uh, the implementation of research and who would be able to access these documents. So in dealing with these press review queues, they have employed the JCIT matrix so that documents that are generally um, not available to a public user would not be available to the press as well. Um, one of the other things that have come has come into play is the ability to um, redact. Um, we have relied on attorneys to do redaction um, in accordance with the rules. Uh, some attorneys are very diligent, others not so much. So there are occasions when clerks will review documents and apparently there are uh, there is uh, sensitive information and those are returned for correction and we have that percentage, it's relatively small. We also have returns based on attorney requests. We also have returns based on judges orders that the doc that, that the, the, they're returned for correction. We don't know the basis for that. We don't know if it's because the attorneys realized maybe they had trade secret information or some other thing that was in the document that they wanted back for. We just don't know. And we don't know why judges are returning documents for, for correction. It could be everything from they may have some standard or rule that they use where you need to attach certain information that's particularly true in family law cases, uh, which wouldn't be available anyway, but those are being returned and we have the statistics on that. But the generating issue that has created a, a problem that um, is creating lawsuits actually across the nation um, is that clerks in Texas and in Texas in particular, there is a a uh, concern that the processing time for clerks 
is taking days and in some instances weeks in order for them to process a document. And under the current state or model, Courthouse News and other media cannot access these documents until weeks after the initial lawsuit was filed, perhaps. That's worst case scenario. We have an example, and Tracy's on the line, of a county such as Harris County that in response to kind of a court order, they worked out a situation where their new case filings can be addressed, their case initiating filings can be addressed pretty much on a daily basis. Is that right? I mean, I know it's, you know, if you file at five o'clock or 5.30 or six at night, you're not going to get anything that night. Right. You know, we right. have a uh, but that's pretty much the model in Harris County, correct? Correct. If they file the new case filing uh, anytime uh, by 4.30, those uh, new cases are processed and available on our website that same day. Okay. What, what appears to be sought also based on some court filings that I've looked at is the media wants access to case initiation information. They don't want access to every pleading in a case. They're interested in the actual original petition or the the, the case in this initiation uh, document and not other sorts of documents, at least at this point. We don't know that for sure, but that is kind of what they're saying in court in terms of what is it that they're really trying to get. So, um, so that is the issue that was teed up. We started looking at what are the concerns, what are the downsides of, of and, and benefits uh, that might exist uh, with one of these immediate access review cues. And we're going to talk about just briefly, um, the, the press is relying on, on a constitutional right to make public court documents, right? That that's and, and really they're standing in the foot of the public. So it is, it was the committee's belief that if you're going to make a press review queue, that basically it is a public, more or less a public access queue, um, is is what it is. Um so uh Basically, we reviewed kind of the, the concerns, um, and uh, one of the key ones was the potential for sensitive information to become public because that cannot be retrieved generally. Once digital information, sensitive information gets out there, um, it is very difficult to retrieve it, and there's a big concern. Clerks continue to say that they return documents because of um, sensitive data. Um, we also had the corresponding other issue, which is attorneys overstamping documents as containing confidential information. Um, just uh, <laughs> counterintuitively, really, I think if you get to a situation where a lot of attorneys understand that the press is going to have access to documents before the clerk or that sort of thing, they could stamp their documents confidential. If it happens that they're stamped confidential, they will not go into the press queue. That's part of the whole setup that we have for Research Texas. Uh, and in which case, you know, probably more documents will be unavailable than they were currently. Um, we have, um, as we mentioned, returns for corrections uh, for a number of reasons, not only sensitive information. Um, they are wrong courts. But what is a particular concern to the committee were the returns relating to why are attorneys requesting documents back? Probably because they think something's wrong with the filing or the client doesn't really want to file the document. And so um, certainly making those public um, would be of concern. Likewise, it's troublesome that courts are returning documents or asking that documents be returned for correction because clearly they've seen something um, that they deem to be in, you know, wrong with the filing perhaps, and they're sending it out. So, so that again would be a document that would be out available to the public and to the press that ultimately will not be filed as, as, um, as it went through the system the first time. 
So you'd get this confusion perhaps over competing documents. You would end up with documents available in the press queue that perhaps are never actually filed with the court. You'll end up with documents that possibly were changed and information taken out of it that then gets filed with the court. So um, parties might come and go. Uh, in, in, in one case, they were in the case and in another, perhaps they're out. So you, you, you could get that confusion over what exactly is the original document and people could be harmed because they were mistakenly placed perhaps as a party or as a witness or something in a pleading. And it turns out, you know, they're taken out. Um, the, the other thing that is of concern is when we think about implementing the press queue, I mean, actually, I believe it is the, the counties that and the clerks that have to say, yes, I'm going to let my system be configured in a certain way um, and that we're going to agree to this kind of access. I mean, currently that's the status that could, you know, there are other recommendations on what to do with that, but that's the current state of things. So it's on it right now, counties could choose to do this if they desired um, at this point in time. Um, so let's talk for a, a moment about the benefits of a media queue. It, it actually provides a way for all of us, the, the, the general public, to be up to date on, on filings, on information that could be critical and important. Uh, and so that's that's something that we have to take into uh, account. Um, this kind of queue might get clerks moving faster to go ahead and get get a situation where they can process documents, um, initiation documents within 24 hours. So that could be you know, a benefit to make the courts and whatever more efficient um, uh, to do that. So, so those were kind of the things that, um, that the, the committee talked about. And then tentatively, the committee basically thought that the recommendation based on the weight of the harm that could result versus the benefits achieved that 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 the committee was not inclined to recommend this initial uh, access prior to the clerk's um, uh, review. Um, the committee definitely looked at Rule 21 as a deemed filing, not the actual court filing. And looking back at the mailbox rule, looking at rule five um, of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure as well, I mean, it's a timing uh, uh, construct uh, for the benefit of when you drop something in the mail, you know that um, you lose control of it. Uh, and additional time is given to the filer, 10 days under rule five, so that if they put it in the file correctly and it gets there within 10 days, then the clerk processes it and it's deemed filed. Um, in the paper days, filing was filing. It was placing the case, you know, processing it, giving a court uh, court number and giving a case number, and then it's placed in a physical court file. So, um, so the, the committee was pretty... Uh, we had previously made the recommendation to perhaps clean up Rule 21 to clarify that the actual filing of the document um, is really after the clerk um, processes it and accepts it, um, not when it's available for return for correction. Um, and that probably should be clarified. Finally, the, the committee went through and had alternate recommendations that should the court determine that yes, a press queue is something that should be done, that there are absolutely some things that should be done before doing that. One of them is this should be a registration process so that everybody that has access to this press queue um, is a known user and we don't get hopefully a bulk data download from it. So it should be a subscription. We contemplated that users should pay clerks for documents that they download, just like in Research Texas. Um, the documents should contain a watermark, so no one's confused over what is an official court document and what is not. Um, 
the uh, JCIT matrix would absolutely need to be employed and, and used so that documents that are not available by statute or we think by, um, by general agreement, um, because it contains so much confidential and sensitive information, um, that that should be employed. Um, EFSPs have redaction programs that they can use and they should be encouraged, all of them encouraged, to use that and that everybody should be using that redaction program so that lawyers who are responsible for redacting their documents can at least have some belt and suspenders of, okay, at least the, the, the bank numbers, the social security numbers and everything can be pretty easily found through a redaction system. You know, that doesn't help you with trade secrets, but it helps you with those kinds of, that kind of information. Um, The types of documents subject to the press queue should only be the case initiation types of documents. And then once the clerk accepts the documents for processing or returns for correction, it should disappear basically from this press queue because then it's now in the in the uh, uh, the accepted area and goes into research Texas. Um, JCIT should probably publish on its website the monthly processing time to make it very clear how the counties are doing and just monitor and do what we can to educate and assist clerks in getting their time and processing time down and trying to understand what are the issues that are keeping them from moving ahead. Um, and so generally, we sh if we if it's implemented, it certainly should be on a time frame and it should be by the populous counties first um, and then ultimately whatever small counties might be, you know, there at the tail end. Um, and then Harris County, it would not be applied to Harris County because they actually already have a separate deal kind of worked out and they're getting their documents within the, the same day filing kind of criteria. So that's kind of just an overview of the of the committee's report. Um, at this time, I want to start with basically a discussion of the actual recommendation um, and the recommendation made by the committee that that this initial access not be um, not be granted. And so I open that up for discussion um, and certainly welcome opposing views. Absolutely. We're here to, this is a broad, open discussion, and we want to hear from everybody. So um, does anybody have any comments, thoughts on this? Do we agree with this? Do we, are there other things we need to consider? What other benefits might we lose if we do this? Um, what, what other detriment is there if we institute this? I can give you a couple of comments, at yes. least uh, from a Justice Court perspective, but probably at other levels as well. What we see are a number of cases that are filed and the, the plaintiff is wrongly named or the defendant is wrongly named or both. Mm -hmm. And so the, the case comes in and we'll, we'll take the filing, we accept the filing, but then they have to come in and amend and amend and amend. So the question is how many how much case, case initiation do you look at? Is it only the original filing, even though it may have been amended two or three times? That's a good know. question. I could dovetail on that. I mean, a lot of our discussions have been driven by courthouse news, mm -hmm. and all they care about are the original news. Right. But there's a whole bunch of well, I mean, if you ever got the reports, they yes. just they just list you know, all the new losses. Right. But right. there are a lot of other news organizations that you know are interested in other things uh, that can you know motions to quash subpoenas and some stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you know, it seems like much of our discussions really been focused only on the case initiating mm -hmm. documents. And been driven by that because that's the uh, the press organization that's been most vocal about it. But you know, I mean, 
let's face it, TMZ cares more about all the motions that are filed after a divorce is filed than just the initial lawsuit. They want to see what the uh, respondent says in, uh, in their answer and, and so forth. Um, and so, you know, I think that whatever recommendation you make uh, should be broader and really take into account, you know, all the other types of filings that come in besides the initiated petition. Um, so that's that's just kind of, like I said, dovetailing off of what Russ said um, on that front. Is the same expediency necessary, though, for subsequent filings? Can they wait for the clerk to process? Because now they know the hot news is that this case has been filed, this whatever has been filed. I'm just bringing this up. Is there is there less need for rapid deployment by the press on, you know, I'm going to you know, modify my custody. Or, and those are actually, those are probably a yeah. bad example because I'm thinking these are more, uh, these are outside the family sphere and would be more like con contract cases or something. Um, I guess the answer would be a big deal maybe, but generally it's a general denial. <laughs> so I mean, well, yeah, I, so, I, I think you know. They're gonna, I think that's right. They're going to want all kinds of other mm -hmm. things and it depends on what your business as a journalist is. So, for example, I was called a few years ago by a journalist um, for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram that was complaining that Tarrant County was using, in divorce cases for adults, using initials or using sort of a secret docket system for apparently prominent individuals oh, yeah. so that the press didn't know about, you know, wealthy individuals in Fort Worth and their divorce and the details of that. So the Star Telegram may be interested in publishing details like that, and they may be interested in motions and other things and hearings in that case, whereas that's not courthouse's business. So I think that's exactly right. Yeah. But there are going to be other things that different press organizations are going to be interested in. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about the matrix and say, oh, well, it's okay because it, it's going to exclude family cases. But this is just one case by one news organization. And I think we should expect that there will be others. Oh, I, I do. I, I'm just trying to think through, you know, I can understand why it's case initiation because maybe there's a, there's an expediency there and it, there is a staleness if, if it, you know, if you wait two weeks and the case has been filed and maybe things have moved on. I don't know. That's one of the arguments that they make. I just didn't, in my mind, I don't know if, the need for such rapidity is necessary for your, you know, motion to compel your. No, so we're all saying. Well, thinking of the examples of in Houston, we dealt with last two years, twenty-four lawsuits against the star quarterback for mm -hmm. allegations of assault. Mm -hmm. Everything that was ever filed in that was fodder for at least the sports reporters. Mm -hmm. The sport, I mean, was that on the criminal side? No, these were civil. Oh, the civil lawsuits. And every time Rusty Harden or Tony yeah. Busby were going to be in court, they, they were going to be reporters there. And so, yeah. you know, now that's a, an extreme outlier, but that was a, that was a tort case, 24 of them, um, where it wasn't just the lawsuits. It was... You know, no, no, and, I, and I agree that they would want to see the other documents just and, like and, the and public they, should see. They but, wanted that stuff right away. Because it's it's you know okay. what's the latest that's going on now? You also had two pretty media savvy lawyers who weren't going to have any problem making sure the press knew what was filed. Yeah. Right. But exactly. um, but exactly. there's you know there's, really, there's, 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 there's there, from the lawyers' point of view there's some other things are going to publish it. Yeah. The news organizations don't have to go to the court to get it. Well, well here's, here's the difference. Though, is it, that if, was the if, example if, that I if, just gave. If, if I file this, trying to keep it secret though. But, well, the, the ones who want to do that also, like, just by stamping it confidential. confidential. Yeah. So that the, ones who, the ones who want it. Right. No. They file it and then they tip off the reporter because they've got the litigation privilege for any potentially false defamatory statements. And so if they just send it straight to the reporter, here's what I'm going to file, that's 
there's a more gray area there, but if they're saying, hey, but, you should see what was just filed right. in this case. Well, you're going to get, I mean, the thing is, with this anyway, there will be litigation over is it filed or not, because that whole privilege, that whole question will come up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What is, when is it actually filed and when do you get that sort of litigation privilege? When does it attach? So, I just, I, I'll, I'll say, I don't see the, uh, the quick turnaround access issue being substantively different for the initiating case, okay. the initiating document, as opposed to follow. No, I think that's I think, a good point. I think it, for courthouse news, they want the initiating things as right. fast as possible because that's that is their that's business. their business model, right? So right, and they want it remotely too, right? If they want right. to reduce their costs, right? They want to pay one twenty something year old right out of college to sit there at a computer and look at everything that's coming in around the state and pay them three thousand dollars a year. And you know, we've talked again about the fact that um, the the access requirement is that you'd be able to get access to it somewhere. It isn't right. remote access. Mm -hmm. There isn't a constitutional right to remote access. But that, of course, is what they want because of their business model. But that's but that's so. what the clerks all are doing. There is no, nobody is handing out paper. What are we going to do? The clerk here, give me some paper. What well, are we going to do? I, I walk into the clerk's office and go, yes, exactly. let me go behind you your terminal. desk and no, no, go look at your terminal. terminal. And in fact, if you come back and look at when we started talking about these remote access issues, we talked about the importance of owning a terminal at the courthouse right. for this very thing. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this, I mean, I don't, every time I, every time I, to everybody, you're offering yeah. it to, to, to the lawyers, you're offering but, to the but judge, but you're but offering it to the judge. Before it's been. Oh. I, no, and I, I don't disagree. I'm just saying, I think that, um, that, I always thought that they should have kiosks for pro se filers so that they could make it easy and right. put it in. And so some courts have that, I know, and, and courthouses have those kiosks. So you could go get your remote documents. But I think there's a large group of courthouses that don't have that um, at all. And so, um, uh, and so that, you know, I don't know whether they want to have that. I mean, I'm not, I don't know. And I think the other thing I would remind everyone, I mean, I know everybody knows this, but we're we're not, there's no question the press can get access to things that are accessible once it's filed. I mean, remember, this is a very unique yeah. situation of that short window of time, which I can sometimes maybe hours or days or I guess now weeks uh, between what when a lawyer has submitted it and when it's actually been approved and accepted by the clerk and as a in the because I'm old school in the old days as a lawyer I would send somebody to the courthouse to go take the right. paper and a good file stamp and if I called them before they actually stamped that and said bring it back there's a mistake right. I was able to do that and this is taking it away from right. lawyers for whatever reason I mean you mentioned parties but it could be that maybe there's a cause of action that we yeah. decided we don't want to have we want to drop this for whatever reason it's taking that away from lawyers. So I think it's very problematic. I'm very much in favor of access to the media, press, and public of all filings. But I I think the recommendation that we not grant this or in the alternative that, that these recommendations be done is a is a very reasonable compromise given all the considerations. It seems to me that if we said, let's figure out what filing is. And if filing is going to be the traditional definition when the clerk processes and stamp stamps it it's in the file then a lot of the rest of this go, goes away everybody can have access immediately through whatever means uh, the clerks have through research Texas I mean, etc yeah. is right there right. there's no question about what has been filed by whom against whom etc all the rest of this discussion goes away that's the system we have now. If, if, yeah. depending on how we come down on that fundamental question. Well, I don't, yeah. So, I mean, I, 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 I feel very strongly that, that considering that we drafted that. <laughs> 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 no, we actually didn't. Well, no, but we had different language in there. Just what it was supposed to be for, it was a timing thing, that, that uploading situation. 
was always supposed to be for time purposes. Yeah, so the, the but text litigants to not be barred because there right. may be a bunch well, of- Well, to give them a time, a, I mean, a, a clear time, if you need to respond in five days, what is that? You know, is it when it's stuck in the email, you needed to have a firm day. Same thing with when it's postmarked with the, you have a firm date stamp from a postmark, right? But just to back up and give some context to what the rule says and how mm -hmm. we got there. Um, you remember in the old system, you we actually rejected documents. Yes. And, and back when it was voluntary, okay. And the rules that were used, the local rules that were put in place to allow electronic filing, actually used the word reject. Oh yeah. And and so rejection happened prior to electronic filing becoming mandatory. So we go through the whole rules making process, mm -hmm. that same rejection language that's in the template that was used as local rules gets put in to the proposed language for the Supreme Court to look at. The Chief Justice on his own initiative decided that he didn't like the idea of clerks being able to reject documents. So he simply struck that out. That caused an uproar amongst the clerks. And the clerks contacted the Supreme Court and said this would be a mistake. The dean filed language was then written by the rules attorney. It was not language that came from the Supreme Court Advisory Committee. It was written behind closed doors. It was it was it was put out for public comment afterwards. But that's where the dean filed language came from. And I remember this very well because I was in the room and involved in all those discussions. So I just want to give that context to it. We as JCIT did not write the dean file. We wrote like that. that we, what we did was the 21 rule, which was when it is filed, it could be filed, but then it would not take advantage of that day because of the weekend, right? So you didn't get your Saturday, Sunday or whatever. We did that for sure. I know that. Okay. Um, well, the, I'm just saying the dean yeah. file language was not something that we came up. Well, we may have done it. The Supreme Court Advisory Committee may have not yeah. agreed. Right, us. right, right. No, and I think it all got changed. I mean, I'm just saying that the first draft is that the whole idea of uploading when a document is filed, we we talked about it being the upload timing. You had to have a file time, regardless of whether it was whether okay, well, what you're going to do, and so we talked about that. Anyway, but, yeah, but the the as we've discussed, the the purpose behind the dean file language was was that it would be deemed, not that it was actually filed. I Correct. Think we agree about that. Yes, I think we, we all. Do. Whatever we think about, we came up with the language. I think we agree that dean file was meant to mean something other than filed. The traditional file. Yes, yeah. right, right, right. No, and I, that's absolutely true. It was really a thing to give timing, because you had to have a key off timing, just like you had in your certificate of service, just like you have. So, so you needed a date for for you to respond mm -hmm. and to know what you were going to do to provide some certainty. It's a timing <laughs> construct, I, it, just like you would have for the mailbox rule. It's it's it it, it 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 was similar to the mailbox rule, so that you would have a timing date. What we didn't do with that is say give the rule five. You've got ten days, right? If the clerk it requires two things, the mailbox rule for for to get extended time was for the uh, thing to be filed properly, but also for the for the clerk to receive it within 10 days. Um, and so then you can, you know, take advantage of your initial postmarked date. So it, it just, to me, it, 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 it was more an anal analogy to that, to trying to get a specific date and that it would be like putting it in a mailbox, it would be uploading. And I think this takes us back to Bob's comment. I think he's absolutely yeah. right. That is sort of the crux of the issue, right? that that language is being used to argue that it's filed. Right. As they said in the hearing, um, and just kept repeating right. without any sort of background. Correct. Like, no, and, and I think that's, filed. and I happen to think that's erroneous. Yeah. Absolutely. I think we all agree with that. Yeah. That's not right. So, yeah. I mean, and, and, and so that is more, I mean, 
the committee looked at that. I think they were in full agreement that that's that we disagree that filing occurs when you the technical filing that takes place occurs because we have a return for correction and everything else. So it, it weighs against that. It's a deemed file. Does does that issue need to take more prominence in our recommendation than to the court that like look here's sort of the crux of of the problem. It, it's addressed first in yeah. in this recommend in, in the in the recommendation. We haven't gone through and looked at case law and done an actual briefing of that issue. Um, you know, we looked at it more as a process, you know, more of this as let's look at the process, let's look at what happens, how it occurs, and that sort of thing. So it's a very good question. Should we spend time to do more essential briefing on that? and include a, a, a more a legal argument regarding that. And that's- I mean, that issue aside, I still don't think it's it's a good idea yeah. to provide this, right. you know, un, immediate Either access. Way, I, I do think it's going to, I don't think there's like a logical legal line that you could draw between right. initial case filings and, and other filings in terms of the press's interest and their right to know about mm -hmm. it. So I do think that, you know, this is just been opening the door. Well, but the but, but is, is there, isn't there a shorter window? I know you've been wanting to, yeah. isn't there a shorter window be, between additional filings and the original filing? Because you've got to create a cause number. Yeah, I mean, I would yeah, think that, that so those I think are- it's, I think that's window, why it's a shorter, yeah. it's a shorter, yeah. it's a shorter it's, turnaround. Yeah. Which is going to work, start working up citation and all that stuff yeah. too. There's a lot of work up, but the point of, was going to make was just to build on Judge Hines' initial concern uh, about the the slippery slope. You know, we're we're looking at this from a standpoint of building out this this uh, press review queue, and what additional burden is it going to add to the press review queue to include everything filed versus just initial filings? I have to think it would be pretty much a unworkable at that point. I mean, sure, there's bound to be technology that would allow us to address it, but if a document is coded original petition or, or however it's, it's coded to trigger entry into that queue, well, that goes away. So in other words, what's happening then is every single filing sent in is going to have to be filtered through the press review queue unless we come up with some other technological solution. And that's me, I, I was already convinced, but this is a practical problem that Right now, we don't have a solution for, even though we have the, the press review queue available, just because we don't know the potential impact, at least sitting here today, of what putting every single file through. Well, the interesting be. thing is, how does that show up? Because when you think about it, what we're talking about is the document only stays up in the press queue until the clerk now has accepted it, it goes back down. So it's like great. Right? It's it's a new thing every day. So you know, it's 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 your it's case changing. and whatever. And it's it's, it's going back and forth all over. The place. Well, that's what I mean. It's yeah. it, and you would have to check every. I mean, it would it would be every day. As soon new as an stuff. Answer, it's filed. It's and, and, which is routinely done. I'd say minutes. In, in many cases, hour. You know, it's, it's the press review queue. What kind of burden is it going to be to have that document first filter through the press review queue? And then, you know, say it's an hour later, it immediately snaps out of that. Why does it need to go through that? I don't think, here's the thing, and, and, and I guess I have um, a great belief in Tyler to some extent. Our Research Texas construct would support that press review, press review queue in some respect, except that there's no organizing principle. Do you see what I'm saying? You've got, because whatever... They're faded away. So there's no, the, the press queue becomes a totally non organized, no case number. I mean, for it. no. It is, it's going, it is going to cause tremendous harm mm -hmm. to folks down the line, particularly when this one versus this one. No, this is the right one. No, it's not. We took action on X. Well, you should have waited an hour because now it's Y. I mean, I, I don't see, yeah. I don't see how this particularly, I mean, we, I think most everybody here would agree that over time, this is going to affect every filing, civil, family, yeah. criminal. I, I mean, it's once we start down this road, I think everybody should recognize it will be everything at some point 
with the possible exception today of uh, juvenile cases and seal. Well, and, doc and, and documents that are statutorily. Well, yeah, but, I, but, so. but I mean, the vast, vast majority of documents that flow through the court systems at all levels, sooner or later, will be moved in this way. But I would tell you, I mean, for purposes, and the public, to me, definitely has the right of access to court documents that are filed. Absolutely. So after the clerk processes this, Absolutely. I think that's that, no that the fact that they get that stuff, that's what they're entitled to. Everybody needs to be wrong. No, yeah, I yeah. think I, th there's a fundamental issue here that's really driving all of it. And that's the, the clerk's processing scheme. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe the approach here isn't so much to set up an entire new infrastructure, but to look at uh, proposing standard, maybe even rules mm -hmm. to um, guide and incentivize clerks to become as efficient as not to be a homer, Harris County is that they can process their petitions same day or you know within 24 hours. Yes, they have more resources than anyone else. That's no question. But maybe the approach is look, we've got to work on getting the processing delay. I agree. And, and that really addresses a lot of these issues. Because if if you know, look, if I file something at 1150 at night, it's not going to get processed on this day. So, but, you know, if if it's taking three or four days to get a petition file stamped, that, that to me, you know, recognizing that some counties don't have the resources, they may have one deputy clerk, I understand that, but let's figure out maybe there are, there's a different approach and, and it's more towards that training and guidance on that front. I don't disagree, and we should do something in the standards along that lines, even if it's a preference or preferred or as soon as practical, reach standard, whatever. But to me, we need to we need to come down and define when a case is filed and clear that and clear that up. Is that for or when any, when, any filing, when any filing yeah. is filed, because if it's going to extend to motion for this purpose. Well, I mean, I think we should make our recommendation about what well, we filed. But. I, I think it's being used as, a, as an argument. Yeah. The case it gave us, what was it, 30 megabyte spreadsheets with right. all the detail. I got to tell you, I sifted through that and tried to find a dozen different ways to figure out where the delay is. Right. I filtered out JPs. I filtered out all the toll road civil fines. I mean, there, there's so many in there. It's hard to find one pattern, but I think it's clear the largest counties really don't have a huge delay issue. If you look at their median numbers, they're getting them filed and done, whether they're Harris County or not. But we've got another 200 counties that have you know, one or two people running an office and had to leave early, so. Well, and, and I think you need to factor for, for exceptional circumstances as well. I mean, I think that there's funding issues for different counties that are important, but I also think, for instance, when the legislature changes a law, whatever it is, and then it takes effect September 1 of the, of the following year, August 31st, the clerk's offices are going to be inundated with filings through no fault of certainly the clerks okay. uh, or necessarily anybody else. Yeah. But I mean, I think that there needs to be understanding that you're not going to get every filing within four hours or something when there's an incredible volume or peak for whatever reason. And, and that's just one right that, that it's a recurring example, but there could be, you know, plant explosion. I mean, there could be a million different Two years, reasons. Four years after each hurricane. There you go. John Moore talked about his office. I think I don't know how many of his staff were out sick or so you know didn't come back from the pandemic and they were trying to hire and it's a horrible staffing problem that he had. Judge Doss has Justice Doss has something to say. So Justice Doss. Yeah, go for it. yeah. Justice Simmons, one of the things I appreciated that that's been included in the proposal that you did discussed and I think it's important to remember when we're talking about the issues of clerk processing time 
is that is really two things in the proposal that you mentioned. Number one, counties can choose to do the press queue on their own if they choose to do the press queue on their own. So if for logistical reasons, they are unable to get things processed faster than 24 or 48 hours, that may be a different issue that this committee needs to address or that Supreme Court needs to address. But the they in theory, they could go to a press queue on their own if they chose to go to a press queue on their own. We don't need to make that available 254 counties just as a matter of policy. And I think the second part is that you pointed out is having a proposal of putting the processing times online is certainly something that incentivizes clerk's offices processing their times earlier so that there's a benchmark to compare processing times. I think that addresses part of the key issue that what we're looking at here is it's not simply what when is a matter filed, but at least according to the folks in this lawsuit, it's the processing time from the time the submit button is clicked until it's actually accepted for filing. And I think those proposals address those issues. To back to Carlos's point about uh, exigent circumstances, that's the language that the Tenth Circuit yeah. used in their most recent opinion. They talk about that um, this five-hour um, guideline, the guideline that the district court had put in place, wasn't uh, reasonable. I guess you could say, and that there needed to be an exception for exigent circumstances, and so sent it back to the district court to look at that. And yeah, and, and in that case, too, they say typically 24 hours, but 48 hours sometimes, you know, so it's a flexible standard. They're saying it's not that there is an absolute under the Constitution drop off. Uh, you know, it's got to be 24 hours. Right. Well, no, hours. I don't. I haven't seen anything. Yeah. To that. yeah. So, um, it's kind of like they know when it's too long. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. that's about that's all right. you I, get. I, I know. I see it. Yeah, right. exactly. Um, and one of the things we did talk about um, was basically, notably, is the slicing and dicing of all of these statistics because our clerks operate on a business work day and work week. So they're only there eight to five, but yet we offer filing 24-7. And so, um, so if you basically say, what's the delay? Well, you'll see massive delay between the filing that occurs at 5.30 on a Friday and then when it's processed, you know, past, you know, on Monday. So I think we also need to recognize and, and probably include more information about, about that, that numbers that are tossed around about processing time. Um, probably need to be looked at closely because um, if a clerk gets something at 4.30, it is unlikely that anyone, even when I used to throw takeover lawsuits, you know, the clerk's office was starting to bar the door at 4.45. They didn't want you in there with your <laughs> TRO and your, you know, whatever you were wobbly trying to get done before 5.00. Um, because it was because I would have to stay late and whatever. And so I think we also need to recognize that timing issue that creates this this argument that there's extraordinary amounts of delay. Well, I mean, politics. there is there is delay, but I mean that that in fact, um, that that um, it's unreasonable to expect a clerk to be able to process something that comes in at four forty five. If we're going to be putting these statistics online to incentivize clerk's offices to work faster, they absolutely have to be adjusted. Correct. For the, yes. those delays, like, yes. you know, between 501 right. and 759 the next right. night right. Um, over the weekends as well. Yeah, and it's not clear to me how that's being done on the data that Tyler is giving us. Because like I said, the, the data for my office um, yeah, I mentioned my fastest processor comes in at 7.30 in the morning, and she kicks out probably, you know, five to ten things every day that were filed overnight. But you look at her numbers, and her processing time numbers are the worst in the office because of this overnight delay. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So, um, so I, so I, I can tell you that the data that I provided to you all in the spreadsheet took out weekends and the evening right. hours. But what you find online on the e-file stat side, it's a straight, here's when the button was pressed, 
to here's when the button was pressed. And so you are getting that when they when they file it at 7.30 p.m. and your person comes in at 7.30 a.m., well, 12 hours is already ticked by on that. Well, and that's time. absolutely the cudgel that they're going to use to say you need to move quicker. But it's based on kind of incorrect data. So I think so. I think looking at, at the recommendation of the subcommittee, which I think is very good, I would just suggest that we amend letter G to incorporate the discussion we've been having and say something along the lines uh, that account for filings outside working hours, including holidays or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and I think Tracy and I had both mentioned that mm -hmm. previously. Right. We didn't think that things are filed after hours should be in there until the next right. Correct. Right. Yeah. 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 A lot of their calculations on how long it takes to accept the filing, they are including everything after five up through um, 8 a.m. Yeah as well as holidays and weekends, which is fair. It, it's just it's just straight time. The file puts hit submit here and the clerk hit accept there, and it's the difference between those two times. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Are we voting today on what our recommendation is going to be? Or? What I would like to do is um, the Supreme Court has asked for a recommendation on or before December 15th. Um, this is kind of the first draft and first report out of the committee to the larger committee. It would be nice today if we decide what, you know, based on do we have enough information to, to at least know are we going to recommend um, that they not do this press review at Q, or, or are we strong enough to say we believe that it should be done? Um, and um, and if we can reach that question, we've talked about a number of things that could be used to that need to be incorporated into any any sort of uh, recommendation that we've talked about today. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Would it make more sense then for us to vote on whether we're going to recommend yeah. the press queue, and then if we right. are, then kind of fly spec and wordsmith this alternative. Yeah, no, no, that's what I hope to accomplish okay. today. So that's, yeah, that's good. Two questions. Yes. One, uh, are we you're limiting this only to e files? Because, uh, you know, a certain percentage of cases that are not e files. Is that right. point? Right. It was for all the, the you know, pro se. Pro se They're not going to have them in the system anyway. So yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, th I think courthouse ministers just hasn't brought it up because they're not interested in that. So, okay. The, they don't want the Prince of Nigeria's last name. Those are pretty interesting, yeah. actually. Has had his hand up. Can we, Mark? What's what's the? You. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi. I, I I'm curious. Uh, does our does this a proposal create a system that would create a press queue or that would potentially give them access to originally filed petitions prior to the time the clerk accepts them and publishes them to Research Texas, in which case the attorney for the respondent, uh, husband or wife, for example, <laughs> would not have access to that document. Uh, especially if it was labeled, or I should say mislabeled as containing sensitive information uh, or filed under seal or filed under initials. And yet the press would have access to it, which would no. sound like a, an absurd result. And so right. that's why I was so, asking for So, it. right, good, good question. And so let me make clear that um, that this would be a public, the, pre, the quote press queue, I feel like, I don't know that there's an argument that you can make that the press somehow gets access to a queue, but the public wouldn't. Um, I think their interests constitutionally would be the same. Um, so, so you have, um, so they would have access, but the recommendation is, and I think this would have to be the case, documents that are statutorily prohibited um, there's a matrix that JC and you worked on this, Mark, very, very strongly. There was a matrix created on what goes into Research Texas. That same matrix would apply and it would be using the rights related to what a public user would have. That's all that the press would get. So they aren't getting a lot of the family law, particularly if children are involved cases. Um, and um, and so that's kind of, does that clarify kind of what the what the recommendation 
would be even if even if there was a press queue that that's kind of what our recommendation would be yes i, I still i still believe that that attorneys uh that need a legitimate access if they're potentially representing a party have a higher need than public yeah. uh, for purposes yeah. of, of the clarification of the matrix but my re my recollection was that the matrix uh contained um a, a level of access uh that did not prohibit a delay in petitions filed for divorce absent Harris County where there that, that law is in yeah. effect that's right I think that's right I'll have to look at the matrix no I think for a divorce case um, you know, certainly the sensitive information would have to be redacted as you and I know, I don't know, do you file your divorces now without putting in confidential contains confidential information? Well, 21C That's defines it. that. And, and I think a lot of attorneys are putting that label on, yeah, whereas they previously do. they weren't. And it's, it's yeah. a significant problem. There's problems on both sides of the aisle here, but, uh, 21C defines sensitive information. Uh, and I'm, I'm, and so, I follow the rule. I have to follow the rule. Yeah, no, I and, and so divorce is my recollection is that divorces are um, available under Research Texas to a public user. I mean, with with redaction. Now, if children are involved, that all of a sudden you can't have, you know, the children's name. The, uh, lots of other things come into play then. And that's where I see that basically the forms that are used all have confidential, contains confidential information on the forms before you ever really start, you know, implementing it. But those are good questions. Well, abs absent 40 actions, uh, would this provide access in a press queue prior to the time? a potential responding attorney would have access? Uh, it would, yeah, because it would be immediate. It would take place within, I don't know, five seconds, 10, well, be very, two it, minutes. It would be public, the attorney would have access, but the attorney wouldn't know about it. Correct. No, well, that's what I'm saying. At the same, at the Often, same time, they, I was going to say, when they hit the submit button, that's when services, well, but it's a but new petition. It's going to be, it's going to be it's not going yeah. To so happen. oftentimes we'll be monitoring for a filing. And of course, I have some more stories on it, but uh, until the clerk accepts it and yeah. assuming the clerk makes it available or sends it up to Research Texas, that responding attorney would not have access. Why would we give press access? to a document that a party's own attorney wouldn't have access to. I mean, I, all I can say is that, you know, unfortunately this, pre, this press queue is a public queue. You'd have to monitor it every day in addition to your, you know, you to your other monitoring. It's going to disappear from that thing right away. Yeah. yeah. And it won't be there anymore. Right. right. So to, to clarify it or to make some clarifications of things that I'm hearing, the press review tool is not dependent upon the volume. So if you say all the cases, it's actually just a window into the EFM. So the documents are sitting over there and they have a status as they move through. So like Dennis says, as soon as it switches from right, under review fine. to accepted or returned for correction, then it's out of the press queue. Well, and, and there's no architecture, right? They just, how do you, I mean, if I'm going to this press review queue, mm -hmm. since there's no case number and there's yep. no nothing. I have a county, the case type, and and the party. I've got- Maybe I've got a party's name. That's yep. really how I'm going to have to filter. It. There's no other way. I mean, they're just floating in and out. What, what yep. Tracy, what, what Harris County did, is they just had a fixed window where everything sits in that window. The only thing we're doing different is we're saying that window is only good until it enters the official right. system, and then we yeah, have research passed. access. Yeah. You have access to it there. If you yeah. had access here, you have it access to right. it there. Nothing is changing. It's just where you look for it. You need immediate access for the initial filings. That's where you go. Yeah. But we know some of the courts are going to pick that up, and they're going to file it. I, I do think Bob raised a very good issue. We talked at length about what's deemed filed versus right. filed. And that language has shown up in a lot of the, right. the precedents that Blake shared with us. 
and it's it's a vague term. I don't know that this committee should address that, but I think it probably deserves a mention to the justices. Somebody needs to decide right. what, what language we should be using so that yeah. this confusion doesn't happen when it becomes a litigious issue elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true, that's true. Okay, are we ready then? It would be helpful then, I think, if we go ahead and vote on, um, uh, basically, do I hear a motion? Do we wanna make a motion on what we're gonna vote on? We recommend that the uh, a press queue not be implemented. I second that. Okay, so this is the immediate access prior to court processing and acceptance, correct? Okay, so um, so all in favor of not providing well, your voting members, right? That's what you want. Yeah, yes. not members. providing um, immediate <laughs> access, and if you are a voting member. Um, please signify in this room with your hand. Okay. All opposed? Okay, so voting members on Zoom, can I see your, did you get those down? Can yeah, I see I, your I, I, hand? I have to call them out because okay, some, some are on and some are not. Justice Doss? I'm I'm in favor. Okay. Uh, David Escamilla. You may have to unmute David. Or give a thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> so, yes. okay. Judge Ferguson. Aye. Uh, uh, Laura Hinojosa. Aye. Dean Stanzioni? Aye. Mark Unger? Aye. And then Ed Wells? Aye. And I don't think John Warren is with us today. There you go. Thank All right, you. any opposed? Okay, so I like this strong <laughs> opinion. Not a lot of argument on that. All right, so we have basically um, have what our recommendation will be. Um, now we need to make sure we include all the uh, important arguments that support our recommendation. Um, so we have some of them briefly laid out in the draft document that you have. One of the additional things that is really not addressed in here includes the um, the 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 twenty four seven media time versus the clerk's eight to five time. Just kind of and the statistics and the impact. Well, it's not just the media time; but it's the twenty four seven Lord Bernie time. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. right. Yes, I'm complaining. Well, and I mean, it's eleven fifty nine. Yeah. If you file it, yeah. If you submit at 459 and it's not accepted until yeah. 830, it's not on Saturday yeah. afternoon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And but the people. but the attorney, while while the document is being has been submitted, so the clerk hasn't reviewed it yet, the attorney has a way to back that back out. They can cancel that filing at any time before the clerk reviews it. And they have to call you, right? Nope. No, they, they can do it they through the, the e through and, and zap it there. Oh, so they can do it all, through automation. And if okay. you zap it there, it also comes out of PRT as well. Okay. I think another point, Rebecca. Okay. I, I can see you right. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay. And I don't know if it's an argument or perhaps we could even consider developing a recommendation is... Uh, fixing the underlying oh, delay. Oh, definitely. That that seems to be the key issue there, whether coming up with guidance, training, standards, rules, or uh, getting clerk's offices to process these documents uh, in, in, in what we consider to be a time. And, and I think that's an excellent point. The committee talked about that and talked about using standards perhaps where we can, using education where we can. 
um, and, um, and really bringing home the import of these have to be done timely. Um, and, um, and, and bear in mind, there are some courts that will probably start using possibly this immediate access because from a clerk's perspective, they might want to, if they're used to their regular tax filers, they know who they are, they deal with them every week, big bunch of cases. There are There is a court that lets those in and, and just accepts them automatically. It doesn't contain a bunch of garbage. They know and they meet with them beforehand and, and they're doing it the way that they want them done. And that takes uh, that makes them more efficient. And Basically, then maybe they'll have more file. time to address these yeah. other issues. So, well, so. Yes, do, should, we, should we think about using, to me, saying that they're granting immediate access. What they're granting is access to a case that has not been filed yet. We're not saying people don't get immediate access once a case is filed. Right. Okay. So when if we're going to say some courts are going to grant immediate access, it's kind of like, well, what are the other? Doing? Well, what there it's theirs is immediate acceptance. Theirs is oh, automatic yeah, whatever acceptance. Whatever we, yeah, whatever. And that's the difference. It's not necessarily immediate. It's automatic acceptance. That's, and their 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 architecture. It, it's coming in automatically accepted because they have worked out ahead of time what the parameters of those pleadings look like. Right. And, and then they go into research, right? So, yeah. I mean, they can become accessible. So, and I can tell you right now. Yeah, go ahead. Along this line, this is kind of a broader issue, is looking at some sort of system for more accountability when with the e-filing process. And I, this is a larger issue, but, you know, okay. we've all heard the horror stories about Cases being or documents being returned for correction, you know, and, and filer like I, I got a call from a lawyer who said he was being charged a hundred dollars to file a motion that is a no fee motion, and the clerk would not accept it. I mean, it was extortion. Now, I mean, it, it wasn't going into the clerk's pocket; it was going into the county treasury, but. You know, there, there was a discussion with that clerk. If that's just the same person that ended yeah, up probably was, me, and, probably and there was not the payment did not have to be made, or else it was refunded. Right, so, right. But the yeah, point being, yeah. we we heard these anecdotal yeah. issues, or stories. I had them when I was back in private practice, getting things. The return for correction was attorney requested it, and I called the clerk. I said, "I did not ask for this to be returned. You need to fix this." Um, so. Again, this is a larger issue. Can we explore some sort of accountability or use the word appeal appeal process for this? Because we're in this situation where sometimes people get get stuck. But we're, you know, if if you got to you file the petition and they still haven't accepted it after nine days, what what can the what can the, the lawyer do? Right. You know, well, what question, else can they do? We talked about this last year or year before, and the question ended up being who has the authority to act? Right. And that, that's why I say it may be a larger issue. I mean, it's a, and, and I think what we've tried to do in the past and have talked about is like for the instance, the return for correction, we decided, okay, we'll start putting up there the counties that are returning, you know, way, way more than whatever. And all of a sudden, the, the, everybody kind of started getting better at, at, at returning for correction or whatever. So we've tried to use, you know, kind of the kind of a hero and kind of a not so good sort of metric. And I'm not sure maybe that's what we go to for this processing time and be able to publish that somewhere either on JCIT website, but also send it to the clerk so they can circulate it. Yeah, I, I was hopeful that it was the uh, clerk, oh, clerk dashboard, you know, that was supposed yeah. to be used to ask out their office. Would be yeah. Helpful. But it's kind of a hot mess, really. It's it like, is? Yeah, I looked at it the other day and I just, I, I can't make heads or tails out of uh, the data that's uh, supposed to be, it's terrible. Uh, oh, no. So I don't, okay. I don't think it's really, I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit. Yeah. Trying to get well, and, and we can we can work on that, too, because yeah. like I know that they're quoting straight time. And so 
if, and, it, and it's not just that, but it's just the, the website interface um, and just trying to even find like the basic information that I'm looking for yeah. about what's going on in my office. It's yeah. just, we can certainly change that. that. Yeah. Particularly since it's named after you. Uh, yeah. I right. know the, the, <laughs> yeah. the honorary dashboard the play popcorn dashboard it's such a disappointment that is not I'm so sorry about that I, I disclaim <laughs> the Hawthorne dashboard and so um no but that could be part of this this whole sort of assisting the clerks because if they can't see yeah, like no, whether they're I, doing I, well I, or I, not, I, not I, then because I said, you know, look before we, we shame them, that's it. We right. give them the tools so they yeah. see easily what's going on in their office, but it's 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 not there yet. Well, and yeah. I mean, we we could certainly round up at least the clerks on JCIT and review yeah, that I and, and work with like we that. can and I know the folks at Tyler that are doing that are more than happy to make any adjustments that we want to put in place for that. And reviewing that large pile of data. It was a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the terminology we use is very confusing. The hours and how we count, we don't define a lot of that stuff. I mean, today we, we saw Evan talk about getting rid of, not getting rid of, but supplementing the word reject with return now formally we don't have to pretend like reject and return are two, two different, different flavors things. of the same right. thing but once we define what filed means and what the hours are that are counted it will be easier to present the data to the clerks so it looks reasonable absolutely I, I, i'm not saying that the data is bad it's just a, it's a lot of stuff and it can be interpreted a lot of different ways and I think that will help if I have those terms and setting those targets. And even if it's just a recommendation from the justices, that gives the clerk something to work toward. I think we could do better. But yeah, no, I think terminology is important because it's created confusion because we're using a paper term file instead of the digital term, which would be acceptance, I guess. Um, so yeah, no, that's a that's important, and that might help um, a lot with this discussion. Is the recommendation regarding perhaps recrafting rules to use better set of language, better better language. Um, and I bring up kind of a different yes. issue. There's a couple of things that the justice courts uh, are unique to them. For instance, we're the court of original jurisdiction for evictions. Right. Okay. And so even if you did this due process, uh, you're notifying the, the, the press before the defendant has even been served. And what's the press going to use this information for? Are they going to go, say, hey, you can avoid service by moving out or, or finding ways not to be served, even by ordinance service? I mean, uh, my concern is, is that the, the cases that they should be most interested in are the ones where both parties have been served, or, and, and mm -hmm. there's a counterclaim that the, that's been served as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I the whole idea of giving immediate access. Uh, man, I was on the bench until six thirty last night, and and we. Uh, and entered, you know, 64 eviction proceedings probably early this morning. Wow. That was three days in a row, 191 cases. I mean, that was just, just on that one. So Brent was doing on Wednesday. Huh? Was doing on Wednesday huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and but, so but there's a lot of them that don't get served. Or I, I get small claims case where they filed against the phone number. They filed against the phone number? Yeah. I know all kinds of pro se stuff. It's crazy. Oh, that's right. That's, yeah. yeah. Okay. But, 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 but the debt collection is usually a law firm that specializes in yeah. collections. Uh, and you, you publish that. 
and what was a person who didn't even know that a case had been filed against him is questioned by media. Uh, what are you doing about this? Why didn't you even know that it happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's um, it uh, I mean that's that's what this too does. I yeah, and I've I've expressed what you're saying at points too, even in yeah. court, because like, especially about the nights and the weekends. Right. I could see the press you know, hitting Twitter or you know their own website with a story about you know some case that's been filed and the judges themselves don't even know it and they're learning about it from the press. Um, and I don't think that's a good thing. Right. No, that's yeah. that's, that's I do think it, true. it's probably important to mention that there are two counties that are already publishing a media. Yeah, Harris and Travis. The other one. Travis. Right. Yeah. So there are two counties that are already doing it independent of what the Supreme Court's doing. Yeah, and we should probably make a recommendation too that we're not saying. The county should be prohibited from doing this. Oh, right. No, and I mean, I, 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 that's a good point. Um, and actually, Harris County, you know, is not doing is not doing a separate press review queue. They actually are the clerks are actually accepting the document, and then it goes up rapidly. Yeah, so they're it's a, they're, processing they're just processing it. There's a form for immediate access, yeah. meaning they, we're going to get it done. So yeah, they're just it, getting it done and getting it out there. It, they're spending the resources to get it done the same day. You're right. Done. It's just can be done. Yeah. Um, okay. Is there anything else? We had some old business um, relating to the free access to research Texas for certain educational organization and governmental agencies. Um, yeah, and, do we want to take that up at all, or it's like twelve o'clock now, so I don't. Yeah, know. we can we can be very quick about it. And um, David, I'll Dave, I see you're unmuted, but my understanding was is that um, David's going to pull up the federal form and 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 tweak it for JCIT use okay. and then be able to bring it back at a future meeting. So that yeah, we, we, we voted, yes, we voted on it. And that was the only last, last thing. Um, I think I've only shared with you, Casey, the actual federal form, see if you have any suggestions, but if you don't, then I'm just going to tweak it and get it to you. That was all that we had left. We've already okay, voted. That, okay. So let's talk about the recommendation then. So you have a draft, please get me your comments regarding this particular draft um you know by midweek next week we have a deadline and we will be voting on our recommendation and the form in which it takes before the 15th i mean i'd like to get this done as soon as possible because the holidays are upon us so i ask that you take time to review this um the committee will work on some of the wordsmithing um if anybody wants to be involved in those discussions please let us know and we'll include you. Um, we're doing it basically by Zoom or Teams or one of those things. So, you know, if you want to be involved, that's great. Um, and um, otherwise, um, we will see you at the next JCIT meeting and I wish you a very happy holiday.